these candles represent the people who have shown to us grace-filled love. This love points us toward God. Will you pray with me? O oh, divine love, it's so easy for us to focus on all the difficult things in our lives. God, life can be hard. But it's easy for us to focus on the difficult things and miss the grace and love that is all around us. So God, we give you thanks for these people that the candles represent, these people that have pointed us toward your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So as we turn our hearts and our minds to the word, scripture this morning, I'm reminded of a story, a story called The Visited Planet. It's a story written by author J.B. Phillips. It's an account of Christmas from a cosmic viewpoint. He wrote about Christmas, not from the manger in Bethlehem, but from the perspective of an angel in the heavenly realm. In Philip's version, a senior angel is showing a very young angel around the splendors of the universe. They view whirling galaxies and blazing suns. Then they flit across the infinite distance of space until at last they enter one particular galaxy of 500 billion stars. As the two of them draw near to the star, which we call our sun, and its circling planets, the senior angel points to a small, rather insignificant sphere turning very slowly on its axis, the Earth. After seeing the splendor and the glory of the universe to the little angel, this insignificant sphere looks as dull and as dirty as a tennis ball. But pointing at it with his finger, the senior angel says, I want you to pay attention to that one. Well, it looks very small and rather dirty to me, says the little angel. What's special about this one. Why would I pay attention to it? Our passage of scripture for today comes from the Gospel of John. Like the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, it too contains a birth narrative. It tells the story of Christ's birth. However, instead of focusing on kind of the human origins of Jesus, John's Gospel gives us the divine origins. It's kind of like the cosmic view of Jesus' birth. John's gospel begins with what is often called the Logos Prologue. Prologue. Logos is the Greek word translated as word in this passage. John says, in the beginning was the word. So this word wasn't created. It has always been before the beginning the word existed. John goes on to say, the word was with God and the word was God. So in this birth narrative, John is making the startling assertion that what has come into being in Jesus is God's eternal word, a word that has existed alongside God since before creation. John begins the story of Jesus beyond time. Beyond history, he is talking about the pre-existence of Jesus. He wants us to know that Jesus didn't just appear in the manger. Jesus has always been. John is pointing to the fact that Jesus is that second person of the Trinity, that second person of the Godhead. Now as a little aside, a little mind-bending theological aside that I got into this week, some theologians would argue that you can't call what pre-existed the incarnation Jesus. 
They argue that Jesus is the human name given to that second person of the Trinity. So they would use either the term the second person of the Trinity or Logos or perhaps cosmic Christ to describe what existed prior to the incarnation. But other theologians would say, no, 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 no. Christ is one person who possesses two natures, divine and human, and you can't split them apart. So it's appropriate to say that Jesus has always been. Don't think about that for too long. I agree with the second theologians. If Jesus has always been, let's call him Jesus. What was Jesus up to prior to the incarnation, you might ask? John tells us. It's right there in verse 1. John says, in the beginning. And with these words, John is alluding to the opening lines of the book of Genesis. Genesis 1 begins with those same words, in the beginning God created. When John uses the phrase in the beginning, he gives us a hint, a clue. He's pointing us to the creation story. In verse 3, he takes that hint to the next level. He says, all things came into being through him. John wants us to understand that Jesus is present when the world is created. And not only is Jesus present, Jesus is in fact the agent of creation. It is through the word that God brings things into being. So thinking back to Genesis just for a moment, do you remember how creation happens? What does God do to create? God speaks. God speaks the words, let there be light. God is speaking creation into being. It is through the word that creation happens. And as Pastor William Rich puts it, we began to understand that the speaking into creation that God did in Genesis was not merely through human words, but through a living cosmic word, a word that is part of the very being of God. So John goes on to tell us that this word that God has been speaking since before time and forever is now being incarnated in the person of Jesus Christ. The word takes on human flesh and comes and lives among us. So Jesus didn't just appear in Mary's womb. Jesus has always been. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Okay, that's interesting. But where are you going with all of this? Sometimes, I think when we think about Jesus, we think of Jesus as a last-ditch effort, a solution to a problem. You know, humanity had a sin problem. We were separated from God because of sin. So God, as a last-ditch effort, came up with solution. And that solution, we think, is Jesus. And then God sent Jesus to earth to be born and live and to die so that our sin could be taken care of. And certainly, certainly I agree that Jesus did take care of our sin. The brokenness that disconnects us from God and each other is taken care of in the person of Jesus. Jesus is the reason that we are in right relationship with God and one another. But here is the point I want to make this morning. Scripture insists that Jesus is not just a last-minute insertion into the story of humanity. No. The second person of the Trinity, the Word, has always existed and has been involved with humanity since the beginning since creation. So through his birth narrative, John wants to make sure that we know that Jesus is both human and time-bound and eternal and beyond all bounds of time and space. Jesus is both the incarnate one and the eternal cosmic Christ. Jesus has always existed and has always been involved in humanity. In J.B. Phillips' story, the visited planet, the little angel looks at earth 
and is not impressed. He listens in stunned disbelief as the senior angel tells him that this small, insignificant, and not overly clean planet is the renowned visited planet. Do you mean that our great and glorious prince went down in person to this filthy little rat ball? Why should he do such a thing as that? Jesus was already in the form of God. He already possessed equality with God. When he came to earth, he didn't abandon it. No, he chose to use it for our advantage. The truth is, when it comes to us, God has always practiced humility and self-limitation. Maybe it's the only way that God can be in an authentic relationship with finite creatures. To create the universe, God has to retreat to make space for us. In order to create anything, God must first contract. God creates by pulling back, and this act leaves a void that enables God's creatures to have a space with which in to be. Then in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, God withdrew enough to allow Israel, God's chosen people, to choose their own path for good or for ill. God pulls back enough to give them and us free will. God self-limits. And ultimately, through Jesus, God is humbled in a way that no one expected. So the little angel's face wrinkles in disgust. Do you mean to tell me, he said, that he stooped so low as to become one of those creeping, crawling creatures floating on that ball? I do. And I think he wouldn't like you calling them creeping, crawling creatures in that tone of voice. For strange as it may seem to us, he loves them. And he went down to visit them and to lift them up. The little angel looked blank. Such a thought was beyond comprehension. One night in the cold, in the dark, among the wrinkled hills of Bethlehem, these two worlds came together at a dramatic point of intersection. God! who knows no before or after, entered time and space. God, who knows no boundaries, took on the shocking confines of a baby's skin, the ominous restraints of mortality. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, an apostle would later write. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. But the few eyewitnesses on Christmas night saw none of that. They just saw an infant struggling to work, never before used lungs. Divine love made visible. Let's pray together. O cosmic Christ, Jesus our Lord, in you, and through you and for you, all things were created. In you, all things hold together. O cosmic Christ, Jesus our Lord, in your heart, all history finds its meaning and purpose. We are astounded that you would love us enough to humble yourself and be born in Bethlehem and placed in a manger. We can never repay you for this divine act of love, but we are ever so grateful for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we're going to stand and sing our hymn of commitment, number 179, God's Love Made Visible. The tune done by Dave Brubeck, the old jazzer, and you might have heard this on Jazz Nativity a few times, 
today we're going to ask uh, Colleen and Cole to play through it once, then we'll sing the first verse. They have a little interlude, then we'll sing the second verse. And, uh, oh, you'll catch on. It just feel jazz in here. God's love made visible, incomprehensible. He is invincible, his love shall reign. From love so bountiful, blessings uncountable. Make death surmountable, his love shall reign. Joyfully pray for peace and goodwill. All of our yearning he will fulfill. Live in a loving way, praise him for every day. Open your heart to pray. unto us to dwell as one of us. His blessing unto us is love shall reign. To him our honor ring heaven and earth will sing praising. Our Lord and King, his love shall reign. Open all doors this day of his birth. All of our good will inherit the earth. His star will always be guiding humanity throughout eternity. His love shall reign. And now we come to give our gifts to the one who has come for us. Let us give.
I invite you to stand and face the center aisle in the light. Hope to see you all tonight at the Christmas dinner at 5. And if your kids are singing, they're to be here at 4.15 to practice with Mr. Ed. Go with God into this day. May the Spirit guide your way. Offer love to all you greet. Like Christ, see God in all you meet. Amen. <laughs> 